All right, we are in Luke chapter 12. And in this passage, Jesus is telling us that we should expect the Lord's return. He's telling us there's a great banquet that is awaiting us. I mean, he, I mean, he's telling us these things in pieces, that this is all through the scripture, but there's a banquet that awaits us, um, depending upon how you translate it, but certainly from the Greek, uh, no less than seven times in these six verses, you're going to find words like watching, ready, waiting, that we're to be watching, ready, waiting, not focusing always on the things of this world. That's what bums us out, it's the things of this world. But to be watching, ready, waiting for Jesus Christ to come back. It was almost, um, well, it was seven years almost to the day now. Uh, Harold Camping uh, predicted the rapture. It would go by time zone around the world uh, for May 21st, I think it was, 2011. And... Um, it scared me a moment because, you know, when, when our time zone got skipped and I was still here, I thought. But, but then he revised it to October 21st or something like that. And, and this is not uncommon. There have been people who've been setting dates for thousands of years now, despite what the scripture says um, about not doing that. They've been doing it. And, you know, we've seen it in our time, uh, whether, well, there's enough of those. Uh, there, there have been a lot of people who've been setting dates, and uh, you can go back into uh, the 1800s. William Miller uh, and his followers were called the Millerites, but William Miller was actually a very solid uh, Baptist preacher, but he, he mis, mistranslated some things and misinterpreted a few scriptures, and he set a date for uh, whatever the date was in 1844. I came and went, and of course, and, you know, everybody was still there, and so he revised it again and didn't work. And, but anyhow, his followers were the Millerites, and uh, then from there, this is, how the, this is how cults happen. Then the Seventh-day Adventists came from there, and then the, J, J, or the Jehovah's Witnesses came from there. Uh, I want to say JW because that's my son now. But, um, <laughs> uh, but uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses came from there. So, you know, you, you find this throughout our time, and... and um, Back in 1988, uh, many people can remember, uh, there was this idea that you know, Israel came into the land in 1948, they became a state in 1948, and, and, and by the interpretation of, a, of what Jesus says in Matthew 24, that the generation that sees these things will not pass away until all these things have been fulfilled. They said, well, 1948 plus, uh, well, a generation is 40 years. 1988 plus 40 equals um, 1988. So we're out of here in 88. And uh, there was a book that, that was published uh, called 88 Reasons for 88, um, which you can pick up for probably a dime now. But um, uh, he actually, the guy's name was, I forget his first name, but why is not and you do what you want with that. But anyhow, the la that was his last name. Um, he, he, he wrote a book about 1989, but it didn't go over too well. Um, of course, Harold Camping what really became known when he wrote his book, 1994, back in 1993. Um, anyhow, this fanaticism about date setting has made many Christians look absolutely lunatic to the world, and frankly... Um, I have to say that in the church today, there are few churches that teach the Bible. Or, well, yeah, actually, there are more and more who don't teach the Bible, but, but, but who do not teach prophecy, will not touch prophecy. And when it comes to a matter of the rapture of the church, um, the pre-tribulation rapture of the church, which is the biblical one. And, and there are three positions for those who don't know. There's the pre-trib position, middle of the tribulation position, um, that halfway through this seven-year period will be taken out, and the, and the post-trib, pre-mid post-trib. And, and some people say, I, you know, no matter how much they hear, they say, I'm pan-trib, I'm just going to watch and see how it all pans out. And, and, but, but people have become cynical about this topic, and some of us were at a pastor's conference this week, and we were talking about, or we were actually, um, uh, we, we, were, we had a session on this. I was thinking, this is kind of interesting, because this is what I'm teaching next week. But increasingly, people don't teach about the rapture, and for, for, 
for a lot of reasons, and one of those reasons is that we don't want to offend people who think differently, and, and we don't want to offend others in the church. Um, the Acts 29 group, the, the Gospel Coalition, sorry, I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes. I'm just saying, you know, we don't want to offend the neo-Calvinists who have other opinions, and, and so we don't go there. And if some of you may, you know, the gears may be going now and say, wait a minute, don't I get podcasts from there? I'm just saying, read the Bible, test everything through the scripture. Don't believe a thing I say. Acts 17, 11 applies. You know, l listen to the teaching of the word and then study it for yourself to see if these things are so. If not, then get rid of me. So, so but, but the reality is that this is our blessed hope. Uh, now, now, you have a, a increasingly, we're going to ask you to use this. Um, but inside here, there's a page called Notes. And uh, I, I know that comes as a surprise. But um, there's, a, there's a place to put notes to just write scripture, because I'm not going to expect you, unless you want to do a sword drill, I'm not going to expect you to go to every single scripture that I'm going to mention. But um, it, you know, this is not just for keeping the dust off the dashboard or you know, that kind of thing. So uh, use this, please, and, and write notes. Paul says to Titus, in chapter 2, verse, beginning in verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. That's a surprise to a lot of people, but that's what grace means. Looking for the grace of God has appeared to all men and teaches us to be looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. People say that the rapture uh, is, uh, the, or I should say, people who would want to discount the rapture, uh, to say that there is no pre-tribulation rapture, where the and, and, and by definition that means that the church is taken out of the world in a flash, um, prior to the 70th week of Daniel. And if you're not familiar with that, we're going to start a series sometime, maybe this summer, called Prophecy 101. I realize some people know this stuff and others don't, so, uh, so hang on. But, um, but the, that 70th week of Daniel is a seven-year period. We kind of just glibly refer to it as the tribulation period. So for our purposes this morning, when I say that, I'm talking about a seven-year period. Okay. Uh, so when, when we talk about this topic, many people will say that the rapture is not historic church doctrine, or specifically the pre-trib position of the rapture is not historic church doctrine, and people want to argue about that. And I'm, I find that often it's far easier to agree with someone when you're, when you're talking, and it's true, it's not historic church doctrine, but it's biblical doctrine. You can go to Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 and find that even in the first century that, you know, that there were churches that had drifted far from what Jesus had taught. And that's only within a matter of years after he descended to heaven. Now we're 2,000 years down the road and we have all these different positions. Okay, so there's a, there is this tendency for, for fanaticism, um, but but we're not to be fanatic. We are to be obedient. We're to live righteously. We're to live godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're not looking for extraterrestrials to take us out of here. Uh, that's not maybe a big thing nowadays, but some of us are old enough to remember that that was a big deal back in the 70s. I remember back in, in 1977, living in Colorado, um, over on the West Slope, there were some people in a place called Fruta. Don't worry about it, it's, real, it's a real name. Uh, Fruta, Colorado, next to Peonia. It's a beautiful place. They, they grow peaches and cherries and apples, and it's, it's just you don't associate it with Colorado. You think of mountains. But uh, there were these people, we started calling them the Fruta Freaks, um, who were going to, who sold everything because they believed that extraterrestrials were going to come on, on Grand Mesa and take them away. 
and uh, and there and there were I mean the TV was reporting it. Everybody was talking about it. They you know the Forest Service was reporting that they saw you know bonfires out on Table Mesa, and uh, no one has ever reported on whatever happened. I've tried to investigate it all kinds of ways. If you want to investigate it, uh, let me know. But um, I. I uh, I remember going out there a couple times and, and trying to figure it out, going out to the Vale and calling the newspaper and saying, do you know anything about this? Well, well we know one guy, actually his, his uncle was one of them, and, um, but he's a reporter and he's on vacation now, so I never got to talk to him. But, but you know, this idea, this weird fanaticism that people get sometimes, that's not the rapture we're talking about. We're not waiting for extraterrestrials to take us out of here. We are waiting for Jesus Christ to snatch the bride out of this world before the wrath of God begins to be poured out on this world. And, and we will be changed at that time, when we, we, th this body, this corruptible body, is going to be changed into an incorruptible body. We will receive our permanent bodies at that time. People who take the Bible seriously, and, I, and that's important, we have to take the Bible seriously, not just based on what some authors say. Then we have to believe that what the Bible says is true, and what the Bible says about the future is true, and if that's you, then you are one of the most wise of Christians. Increasingly, we're becoming a smaller group. And, and, and don't make the mistake of thinking I'm one of those us for no more types. I don't, I don't mean that. I'm just saying that the, the church has gotten excited about a lot of other things and left this most. And, look, and I'll, I'll freely admit, this is the most preposterous of all prophecies that you're going to find in the scripture. That does not make it untrue. It's just beyond our comprehension of how it happens. So what? Let's go down, I won't do it now, but you can go down a list of a whole bunch of other doctrines. Tell me about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, explain it. Tell me about the ascension of Jesus Christ, explain it. Tell me about the, the new heavens and the new earth and the, and the new Jerusalem, explain it. None of us can. So, so just because we can't explain it doesn't mean it's not true. Yes, it's preposterous. But prophecy is 27% of the Bible. Prophecy in the New Testament, one out of every 25 verses, is prophetic. It speaks of, of, the, of the coming of Jesus Christ. He comes on the clouds to call his, his, um, his bride up. And then afterward... After the tribulation period, he comes on a white horse with king of kings and lord of lords written on his thigh, and, and, and he slays his enemies at the Battle of Armageddon. There's two times that are referred to, or that we get sloppy with our theology sometimes, but there's two times you can call the second coming of Jesus Christ. They're, they're, the two of them are lumped into one. And the Lord never intended this to be a matter of academic debate, never intended it to be a matter of argumentation. It's very obvious from some of the scriptures we're going to look at that he intended it so that we would have comfort about our loved ones who've, who've passed on. Confidence in, in where we're headed and, and, and what's going to happen and when he, when he takes us out of here and the courage to live with strength in these last days. With our eyes on the clouds, yeah, living realistically in this world, but with our eyes on the clouds, knowing that he's coming back and he's coming back soon. You know, uh, Matthew 24, Matthew, uh, Mark 13, Jesus says, don't be deceived by false messiahs. He says, don't put confidence in the world. Get ready for the labor pains that are coming upon this world. And we've seen these labor pains. You'll hear of wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines in diverse places. Um, and, and, and we've seen that and, and a whole lot more. We've seen deceivers, we see them now. False messiahs, wars, pestilence, tornadoes, and the list goes on and on. In fact, Luke, in Luke 21, he says, when you see these things become, begin to come to pass, then, then look up, for your redemption is drawing near. Our redemption is drawing near. Our redemption is drawing near. That's the point, that, that we're going to be taken out of here. We're going to receive new bodies. Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that, that the entire 
creation, the entire creation. Your little kitty cat and your dog are looking at you saying, will you get over it? Look to Jesus, because all of creation has been corrupted because of man's sin, because of Adam's sin. All of the trees, all of the flowers, all of your tomato plants, all of your herbs, the rocks in, in your yard, everything has been corrupted because of the sin of mankind and all, A-L-L, means everything. All creation is groaning, straining, looking, waiting for the day when the sons of God, that's us, are revealed, meaning as, as who we are that we receive our new bodies. And so it's important that we look at this and the only time that these things, now the rapture could have occurred at any time, but the only time, certainly, uh, as we look at the general second coming of Jesus Christ, the only time it can happen is after Israel has come into the land. Let me read you a couple of, of verses. I think it's important. Um, it, you know, Paul says, first, let me, before I go any further, let me just say this. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, he said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want you to be ignorant. That means without knowledge. He's not saying stupid. Ignorant means without knowledge. Stupid is when we have knowledge and we ignore it. So he certainly would not want us to be that. I would not have you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says in Romans chapter 11, I would not have you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning, and he speaks of Israel. First Corinthians chapter 12, I would not have you to be ignorant. I mean, it's the same phrase, Greek, English, however you want to cut it. I would not have you to be ignorant concerning spiritual gifts. Second Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 2, I would not have you to be ignorant concerning Satan's devices. There's a pattern here. He, he, the apostle, does not want us to be ignorant about these things, and yet those four things, the return of the Lord, Israel, and, and her place in all of history and God's plan, spiritual gifts and the role of spiritual gifts in the church, and the reality of, of the devil, a real devil who really does um, come against us. Those realities are clear, and yet those are the things that we tend to be most ignorant about. The, those are the things we tend to discard and, 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 and not to care about the most. So I, I say that because it's important that we understand that this is biblical doctrine. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning those who have fallen asleep... It's a euphemism in the first century uh, for, the, for Christians who have died. I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we, he included himself, he was expecting the return and the rapture of the Lord Jesus Christ in his lifetime. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him even those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we... It's not his opinion, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, have already died in Christ. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, meaning those of us who are still walking around, okay, in Christ, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. He didn't say, therefore, ridicule one another, therefore, argue with one another, therefore, comfort one another, because Jesus is coming to call us out of, of this world, and he's going to do it very soon. He says in Romans chapter 11, I'm going to summarize some of these things, but Romans 11, verse 25, he says there that, that, um, that when Israel's eyes are opened, because right now there's a blindness, there's a hardness that's coming over Israel. When Israel's eyes are opened, then the full, that 
the fullness of the Gentiles will have come in. In other words, all the Gentiles who have come into the church at that point, that's it. The door of the ark is closed, and we're out of here. Okay, that's the point. So if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ, please, let's, let's do it today. And it's raining. Let's just fly. Let's go. Let's fly. I'm not joking. I'm serious. Let's do it. Let's plan on it. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your Savior, it's time now for us to, to leave planet Earth. Um, he talks about the great world leader who's going to be revealed after the church has been taken out of here. Oh, church. I, I mean, so many times, and I'm sure you've heard it, but so many times over the course of certainly these last 10, 12 years, we've heard all these questions about who the Antichrist is. Do you think so-and-so is the Antichrist? Do you, do you think the Antichrist is alive today? Yes, I do. Do you, do you think that so-and-so is the Antichrist? I'm not going to name names. Um, not necessarily, but no. Uh, you know, I don't know. And, and, but the reality is we read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 3 and going through verse 8. The reality is that the identity of this one, we call him Antichrist, but he's going to be the great world leader, will not be revealed until after the church has left planet Earth. So it's a fool's errand to try to figure out the identity of, of this great world leader. It doesn't make sense. The Bible says it doesn't make sense. So focus on what he's called us to do. But Israel's going to be preserved. That's what we read, in, certainly in, in Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse 14, going on to verse 31, that through all of this, as the rapture happens, Israel will be preserved with, with all of the nations against her. Israel will be preserved until one day. And the Bible seems to suggest that it will be in a place that we call, in, in, in our language, Petra, uh, has two names in the Old Testament. One is Selah, not to be confused with Selah in, in the Psalms, but S-E-L-A. It means a high rock. And, and also called Bozra, not to be confused with Basra in Iraq. But it's in Jordan, and it's a place we call Petra. And, and, and it appears, based upon what, what the Lord says in Matthew 24, he says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, in other words, when you see the great world leader enter into the temple, which it does not exist today. Those who just came back from Israel can attest. The temple does not exist today, but all you have to do is to, to go online and, and look at the Temple Institute's website and to know that they've all, not only do they have designs, not only are all of the implements for worship created, but They've got plans for what they call, what we call, tilt-up construction, and that, that the, the, the temple can be built very quickly. And when this one enters into the temple and sits down declaring himself to be God, and above all that's even worshipped as God, then he says, head for the hills. That's Matthew 24, 15. Head for the hills. Where are the hills? Those who've been in Israel know where the hills are. That's to the southeast. That's Jordan. That's probably Petra. Anyway, that's an opinion, but it's, I mean, it seems to be supported. But anyhow, that's an opinion. But head for the hills. He's not saying those of you in, in Chalfont. He says those of you in Judea, who are living in Judea, head for the hills. Not those in Doylestown, not those who were living in California, those who are in Judea, Head for the hills. He's talking about Israel. Now, before we go any further, what is this whole deal with the word rapture? And some of you understand, but maybe some don't. You can't find it in the Bible. There is no rapture in the Bible. You can't find the word rapture in the Bible, which is true. You can't find rapture in the Bible because rapture comes from a Latin word. We have English in our Bibles. And so if it, I just read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And he says there, that um, he says in verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be raptured. That's not what it says, but the, caught up. The Greek word is harpazo. Har, we bo, and it means to be snatched, to take it out quickly. And, and when that Greek got translated into Latin many, many centuries ago, it was raptus or rapuro, 
And, and, and so that's the idea, a rapture. And to be snatched away, that's what it means. Peter says it's very clear that there will be scoffers in the last days. He says in, in um, 2 Peter uh, chapter, chapter 2, he says this. Excuse me, 3. He says, knowing this, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, knowing this, that scoffers will come in the last days. The context seems to suggest believers take note. There will be those who are in the church who will scoff at this idea in the last days. Scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were since the beginning of creation. And Peter says, for this they willfully forget. Willful forget. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water, right? God spoke. Let there be light. God spoke and things were formed. God spoke and there was water. God spoke and, and the continents were formed. God spoke and things began to grow. And God spoke and, and there were creatures on the ground. And God spoke and, and man was created in his image by the word of God. By the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water in the water and by which the world that then existed being flooded with water. But the heavens... And the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, God, by his word, preserve those same heavens and earth right now, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, don't forget this one thing. Take hope for, your, for those you love who don't know Jesus. Beloved, don't forget this one thing. That with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not desiring that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's desire. This is all based on the word of God. Peter is basing this on the word of God. You can write down in your notes Psalm 138, verse 2. and Because it says there, that the Lord, Yehovah, L-O-R-D, all caps, the Lord exalts his word even above his name. If you have any idea about the, 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 the importance of, of God's name, the ineffable name of God, and he puts his word even above that. That just blows my mind. And, and there are these comparisons that we find throughout the scripture. Peter just gave us a comparison. He compared the last days, the return of the Lord, to the days before the flood and then the flood. The flood was a worldwide destruction, and there is a worldwide, I mean, it was a worldwide um, judgment. And, the, and, and in the last days, there is a worldwide judgment coming upon the earth. There's never been any other, just those two. And, and, and so, am I, am I yelling? I'm sorry. I don't mean to yell, I just, I, I get a little excited. But, um, <laughs> but, but he compares it to, uh, the Lord compares the, the final judgment with, um, with the, the, the flood of Noah. And, and as you read the flood of Noah, you can see there are three classes of people. There are three classes of people in the flood of Noah. There are those who were destroyed in the flood. Judgment came upon them. There were those who were preserved in the ark. They were preserved through the flood. And there were those who were taken out prior to the flood. Enoch was taken out prior to the flood. You say, that's just one man. You made, you made it a plural, those. Okay, but it's a, I would say it's a, it's a type. We have a type there of, of the church in Enoch, certainly, uh, because we actually, though we are many, we're one, because we are the body of Christ, all right? And, and we're all members of the same loaf, Paul says. So we're, we're one. I don't want to take that too far, but, 
Um, you can go through the scripture, you can look at a, a lot of these snatching away. The first one who was raptured, who was it? Come on, I think you know it. I just told you. Who was the first one? Enoch was the first one who was raptured. Very good. Yeah, who was the second one who was raptured? Elijah, taken out in the fiery chariot, right? And he was taken out. He, he didn't die and then taken out. He, 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 he was raptured. He was snatched away. Um, the word is not harpazo there because it's, it's Hebrew. We read about Philip who goes from Samaria. The Lord tells him to go to Samaria and to speak to the Ethiopian treasure. And he goes, he does that. He leads the man to the Lord. And immediately after he baptized this man, he was taken up. He was caught up and, and taken about 80 miles north of there. And if you look at the word yourself, you can do it. With the tools we have today online, you can do it yourself. He was harpazoed. He was taken out. Um, uh, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he refers to how he was caught up to the third heaven, to paradise, and he explains what he saw there. And he uses the word, harpazo, I was taken up. That suggests it wasn't a dream. It wasn't, it wasn't some mystical thing that came over him. The suggestion is he was taken up, and then he was brought back down again. I don't get it either. John says in, in Revelation chapter 4, after these things, after, after, after seeing Christ in the Isle of Patmos, after <laughs> writing seven letters that were dictated um, for the seven churches, he says, and then immediately after these things, chapter 4, verse 1 of Revelation, I saw, I saw a door open in heaven and a voice called to me saying, come up here. And immediately I was harpazoed. Look it up for yourself. Don't take my word. I was harpazoed. I was taken up to, to the Lord. Jesus, he was harpazoed. Acts chapter 1. And of course, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The entire church will be harpazoed. So it's important that we look at these things. It's important that we read these things. It's important that we always keep this in front of us knowing that, yes, I have work to do. Yes, we have jobs to perform. Yes, we have families to provide for. Absolutely. But there is coming a day as we see this world continue to erode. Yes, we should act justly. Yes, we should act righteously in, the, in this present day. We're called to do that. We're salt and light in this world. But that's not our only job. We're to be looking up, eyes on the clouds, saying, Lord, I'm listening. Are you coming? For me, are you calling us out of here? When? I mean, I, I know I'm going to see the Lord, whether by death or by rapture. Now, rapture is my preferable way of going, okay? And I'm not afraid of death. The process, not wild. You know, I mean, there, there are, you know, I drop a bomb on top of my head. If I was ground zero, that's okay. Um, I, I, flames, not cool. It's not something I really... That's, I didn't mean it that way. But that, that's not something that I'm looking, I would be looking forward to. But by death or by rapture, I'm going to see the Lord face to face. And so are you if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And we're to be looking ahead to him. By the way, anybody who wants to say, look, you know, I've heard people say, or I believe, now, this, is a, this is a concept that was invented by John Darby uh, back, back in the 1830s. And a lot of people will say that to you. No, he was one who studied the scriptures and brought it back up again for us to consider. Again, people say it's not historic church doctrine. They're right, it's not, because for years the church got caught up in simple, in, in, in dead religion. And then modernism and, and, and all these things. But it's biblical doctrine. It's biblical doctrine. And I could take you, we don't have a lot of time, but I could take you through um, the Old Testament. This is not just a New Testament concept. Some people will say, yeah, 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 yeah Old Testament, New Testament. Two-thirds of the Bible, the Old Testament. You don't see rapture in there. Really? Well, we, first of all, we see two types, Enoch and, and Elijah. But in, in Isaiah chapter 26, just write it down. Isaiah chapter 26, verses 19 through 21. Your dead men shall live. 
together with my dead body, this is thus saith the Lord, he's speaking, together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, for your dew is as the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Now listen, come my people, enter into your chambers, plural. Did you know you had chambers? You have a chamber. Enter into your chambers and shut your doors about you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little while until his indignation be passed. In his indignation, God is going to bring wrath on those who continue to reject him. As you read the book of Revelation, and some people get, get, get wigged out and they don't want to, but, but as you read the book of Revelation, there are two classes of people that you always see. You see the earth dwellers. Though that means, that I'm not an earth dweller. My, uh, you know, I, I, my citizenship is in heaven. And I eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform this lowly body to be like his glorious body. And if you know Jesus Christ, so do you. And that's where your residence is too. That's where your citizenship is, in heaven. And, and so he says, come my people. Enter into your chambers and hide yourself for a little while until his indignation is passed. God, in his indignation, will bring his wrath on the earth dwellers. After the rapture of the church, there'll be just two classes of people. Earth dwellers, they want to build an empire on planet earth. And those who, as they hear the glorious gospel, as they hear the truth of God, angel flying through the sky, people say, I don't know if it's an angel. Just read the Bible, it says angel. I don't I don't know how it works, but angels can do this. And an uh, angel flying through the sky saying, trust the Lord. And so there will be two classes of people. There will be those who are the earth dwellers and those who believe. And they will be martyred for their belief because there's no rapture for them at that point. In his indignation, he will pour out his wrath. Hide yourself as it were for a little while until his indignation may pass. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also will disclose her blood. And, okay. Has that happened since Jesus Christ ascended to heaven? More specifically, Isaiah wrote this in the 700s BC. Has that happened? Has there been a time when the Lord came out of heaven to pour out his wrath on planet earth? No. So this is yet future. It's yet future, unless you take a low view of scripture and you want to make it into something else, in which case you have much bigger problems because that, then, then you got you to mess with everything else that's in the Bible. But if we take a high view of scripture and take God at his word, then that has not yet happened. But that Promise sounds to me a great deal like Jesus' promise to us. Don't let your hearts be troubled, John 14. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions, chambers. But were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. I think he's talking about us. And, and it seems like he's harmonizing with Isaiah 26. I mean, there are more in, in the Old Testament, and we could go through those things. I really do believe that our failure to understand the, the rapture has more to do, and this is, this is theological words, has more to do with our ecclesiology than our eschatology. What does that mean? Eschatology means the study of last things, okay? Ecclesia, we're, we are the ecclesia, where the church com, comes from a Greek word, ecclesia, the called out assembly of God. Ecclesiology is the study of the church, who is the church. So understanding our ecclesiology well really will inform eschatology, you know, what he's going to do with us as opposed to those who continue to resist him. You know, let me read you this, because I know we have to close. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, now, now think about this. Just process this. 
Paul says, beginning in verse 50 now, I say to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You can go to all the health clubs you want. You can, you can run as much as you want. You can exercise as much as you want. You can, you can eat the best health food. I mean, just look at me. What a specimen. I mean, you can, you can do all those things, right? And it's not wrong to do. But flesh and blood cannot. On the basis of the word of God, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither can corruption these corruptible bodies, and they're all corrupting, inherit in corruption. I've told some of you the story before, but I remember back in 1977, you know, backpacking in, in, up, in, up in the mountains, Colorado, with my friend, the dude, those of you who met him. And, and we made a horrible mistake, actually, of, of, of camp, setting our camp downstream from a dead steer. But when we drove past that thing, uh, I mean, the, the smell of this thing, high heaven. I mean, it was just, it was the worst because it's rotting flesh. And, and uh, it didn't make sense to me then, but as, as I started to walk with the Lord, it made sense to me. That's a picture, no offense, really, of you. That's a picture of me. These, this flesh is rotting away every day, thankfully, we take showers, we use deodorant, we use creams, we use these things to keep this rotting corrupting body looking okay and smelling okay but it's still passing away until the day that the system gives out for whatever the reason may be i tell you brothers flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of god nor can in corruption inherit incorruption behold i tell you a mystery a mystery in the new testament is something that was once hidden now revealed that's what it means behold i tell you a mystery we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. He's speaking to the church. Changed. Metamorphosis. To go from being one thing to another. The caterpillar goes and, 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 and builds its chrysalis or chrysalis or however you pronounce that and comes out a butterfly. It's a, it's a metamorphosis. He says, he says, we shall all be changed, meaning and in, in a flash or in a moment, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. It's not, that's not a wink. That's, that's the amount of time it takes for light to bounce off of your cornea. Okay? That's really fast. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, he says, at the last trump, for the trump will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall all be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption. This mortal body must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death has been swallowed up in victory. Think about that. Think about that. He says, Jesus says, when you see these things come to pass, we don't have time this morning to go through all of the things that have happened just since 1948, even the things that happened in 1948 that set the stage for, for the great world government and the great world economy and, and all these things that are about to take place. But we see them unfolding. If we're paying attention, they're unfolding. And, and things, uh, things are still being hidden from us, but so many things have already been revealed and, 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 and the population of the world is getting sucked into it. We know that the return of Jesus Christ is soon, and if his physical return is soon, the rapture of the bride is even sooner. So Jesus says, when you see these things come to pass, look up, for your redemption is drawing near. We're waiting for that moment at the flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, at the last trump, then all of a sudden we're going to be taken out of here. At the last trump, imagine that. It, it, <laughs> It'll probably be louder. And I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if it's something that the world will hear. But you'll hear it. And he says in 1 Thessalonians that, you know, that the, with the voice of the archangel, you know, Paul was there on the ground and the Lord was speaking to him. The guys around him just... They heard something going on, but they didn't get it. I mean, but so will the world understand? No, I don't think the world's going to understand at all. 
but in a flash and twinkling of an eye, a trump will sound, and we'll be gone. We, and we won't just say, can I go too? No, we're, we're going to go. We're just going to go. We're going to leave planet Earth. So how do you live? How do you live in, in the midst of all that? And I, and I think we have to choose to live well. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourself to see that you really are in the faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse, did I say chapter, chapter 13? Examine yourselves to see that you're in the faith. 2 Peter chapter 1, make every effort to make your calling and your election sure. Don't say, uh, you know, yeah, I went forward to the Harvest Crusade. Fine. Are, do you know Jesus Christ? Are you walking with him? Make every effort to make your calling and your election sure. I realize that if you're a teenager, or you're in your 20s or 30s, some of this is like, yeah, but I still want to do this or I want to do that. Okay. Yeah. But all of that, the best you can... Linda Scotto and I were having a conversation, you know, after Michael went to heaven. And she said, I'm trying to imagine what he's experiencing right now. And then I realized, she said, that would be terrible. If what he's experiencing is what I can imagine, that would be terrible. I said, yeah, it's like Joel Osteen. I mean, it's your best life now. It's all downhill from here. And that, that's it. No, I can only imagine. That, you know, we're going to pass through a veil. We're going to suddenly be in another dimension and we'll receive these new bodies. And there'll be more, more of a reality then than ever before. And all those things we longed for in our youth, all those things we longed for in college or, or in that new job or in that marriage or, or that child, all those things. By comparison, it'll fade away. Those of you who are older, and by that I mean much older than me, you're an example to us. We, we want to see how you're living. We want to follow, we're following Jesus Christ, but we want to follow your lead. Those of us who are the boomers, you know, the boomers generation, we have a responsibility to be living godly, not just storing up, storing up treasures on this earth, but investing our time, our talent, our treasure in the work of the kingdom with our eyes on the clouds because he's coming for his bride. Let's stand together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for showing us these things, Lord, and reminding. And I know there's so much more that we could look at, Lord, but just to have a quick sketch, thank you for it, Lord. We want to be ready. We don't want to be ashamed of your coming. We, don't want, we want to live in a way, Lord, that we're prepared. We want to live in a way that because our eyes are on the clouds, because we're watching, waiting, ready, for you to call us out of here. That we would just willingly lay aside then those things that are dragging us down in this world, realizing that at any moment, and it could be today, literally, you're ready to call us out of here. And understanding then that the most important thing, e even in that, is that we be following your will and your command, which is to share the truth, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ with every single person in this world, Lord. And for anyone in this room right now who has not yet trusted Jesus Christ, or who when they look at themselves can't say for sure that they know that their calling and election are sure. Can I say for sure, I've looked at myself and, and, and am I really in the faith or am I just sitting in a chair? Lord, that they would today say, Lord Jesus, thank you for the forgiveness of my sins. I want to walk with you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make me a new man, a new woman. Lord, we await you soon. Lord, just like a bride waiting for her groom. And we don't want to be asleep at your coming, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.